Uh, I'm just gonna try to keep us on schedule as much as possible. Our next panel includes uh, sentencing experts from across the country. We'll hear briefly about sentencing system in different states, and I uh, hope that we all can keep an ear towards what lessons California can learn from their different experiences. Our panelists are as follows, and we'll proceed in this order. Again, as I said at the top, we've read it, submissions if you've given them. We've uh, Our staff has prepared a memorandum uh, giving us a summary of you know your, what you're going to talk about. So if you would please keep, please keep your opening remarks to five minutes, that would be great and have our conversation really take, from, take it from there. So first we'll hear from Kelly Mitchell, the current chair of the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission and an executive director of the Rabina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice. Then we'll hear from Marshall Thompson, vice chair of the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole and former director of the Utah Sentencing Commission. Uh, Barbara R. Levine, former executive director of the Michigan Citizens Alliance on Prisoners and Public Spending and former commissioner of Michigan Criminal Justice Policy Commission. Uh, and Insha Rahman, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, or uh, close enough, vice president of advocacy and partnership at the Vera Institute in New York City. Um, so uh, with that, let's start with uh, Kelly Mitchell, please. All right, well, thanks for having me. Uh, I was one of the people who didn't submit, uh, and that is ironically because I was on vacation in California. Uh, so <laughs> I'm now- hope you enjoyed your time here. I did, it was beautiful, it was sunny, it's great. Um, so I'm back here in Minnesota. So I think that I was asked uh, originally to give you just a little brief overview of how sentencing works in Minnesota. At Robina, we also have a project to do to understand sentencing guidelines across the country. So if we want to get a little broader into that later on, we certainly can. So I'll start. So just for Minnesota real quick, Minnesota was the first state to enact sentencing guidelines about 40 years ago. Um, our guidelines are for felonies only. So that's that they don't cover misdemeanors. Misdemeanors are, are dealt with strictly at the court level. Um, the main factors that go into determining an appropriate sentence under our guidelines are the person's criminal history score, which is a composite of, of multiple um, of adult prior crimes, juvenile crimes, whether they were on custody status when they committed the offense, um, and then the severity level of the offense. And our sentencing commissions, one of our primary roles is to, to look at all of the offenses that have been enacted by our legislature and rank them in comparison to each other. So that we have relative severity um, and we're always trying to figure out where, where offenses fit in. Our grid tells you two main things. First of all, should this is this an offense that should um, get probation or prison? And if it gets prison, then how long should that prison sentence be? Uh, ordinarily, the, the judge, uh, all of our sentences are, are recommended. We do have mandatory guidelines, but the judge can impose a sentence that's different from the guidelines if they articulate substantial and compelling reasons uh, on the record for doing that. Um, I saw in the papers that, uh, that uh, your triad system in California was sort of uh, declared to be unconstitutional after, after the Blakely decision. In Minnesota, that didn't sync our guidelines. Um, and the reason for that is because we developed procedures to allow for a jury trial to uh, prove up those, those facts that support an aggravated sentence. So we still have the ability to impose aggravated sentences as long as those procedures are followed. And those procedures do involve um, the ability of the person to waive that process if they want to. So the judge could decide it or the ability for the person to stipulate to the facts that might support an aggravated sentence. And then the other thing that I really want to um, hit on that I think is, is unique about Minnesota because we are one of the lower incarceration rates in the country is that one of the ways we do that is that we um, really keep track of what's going on with sentencing. So one of the primary roles of our sentencing commission is to um, actually track every felony sentence that's imposed each year so that we can see what those patterns are, we understand that data. And then as each new potential law is pr uh, proposed to, at the legislature each year, we do a fiscal note and we use that historical data to project the impact of that new law on our prison population. And so if, a, if the legislature wants to enact a law that's gonna bring prison beds with it, then they have to be able to pay for those beds. So they, they'll know what that cost is at the time that they're proposing that legislation because we've given them that information. 
And if they can't balance the budget, then they can't pass that law. So that's that's one of the that's one of the ways that we've been able to keep our capacity, um, you know, keep our prison capacity down. The other way is that, um, as I mentioned, our, our guidelines do tell say when probation is appropriate. And honestly, a lot of the cases, um, a lot of felonies are in that probation zone on the grid. We really prefer that over uh, prison if we can handle it. Last thing I'll tell you is that uh, everybody who serves a prison sentence in Minnesota serves two thirds of that time in prison, one third on supervised release. It's an automatic release. There's no, um, we don't have a parole board in, in Minnesota. That was like the five second version <laughs> of sentencing and I will be open for any questions as we keep going today. That was excellent. That was four minutes, a little bit more than five seconds, but four minutes with per perfect timing. Um, perfect. So thank you very much. Uh, Marshall Thompson. Sorry, Zoom meetings. Um, so thanks a lot, glad to be here. Um, Utah has an indeterminate sentencing system, as you may have read. Uh, we deal mostly with felonies in that regard. So the, the felony, the third degree felony is our lowest felony, and it's zero to five years. Uh, second degree felony is one to 15 years. And then a first degree felony is five years to life. And then aggravated forms of that first degree felony could be six, 10, 15, even 25 years to life. And so uh, that, that, that can be a pretty big range. And, and we do have a, a board of pardons and parole. In Utah, we handle both uh, the parole and commutation, uh, the probate, um, sorry, the pardon and commutation decisions as well as uh, prison release decisions. Um, and, I, and I think that helps out in a lot of ways. Uh, but then, so once someone comes to prison, it's really up to the board to decide how long they're going to stay within those statutory ranges. Um, I think one of the great advantages of that is that we can be incredibly responsive to behavior in prison, in responsivity to treatment, um, and to a number of other factors as they develop. Um, I think it's also incredibly helpful in enacting uh, some criminal justice reform efforts. Utah went through a, a, a large criminal justice reform effort in 2015. And um, as you all know, politically, it's very hard to step back from, from incarceration. It's very easy to justify increasing penalties. It's very difficult politically to walk them back. Uh, but since we have this indeterminate sentencing system, uh, we can move the guidelines uh, with a group of experts. That, that, that I think that's much more amenable to those kinds of uh, evidence-based reforms. So that's really a benefit. One of the major drawbacks, and I think it's significant, is the fact that people, uh, I think if you're sending someone to prison, they deserve some expectations of how long they're gonna be there. And that's important for victims who wanna know how long this person's gonna be in prison. It's important for the, the person who's gone to prison, it's important to their family. So I, I think it's really important all around. Um, and, and that is a weakness in our system. To, to combat that, we've had really robust uh, sentencing guidelines since about 1984. Um, and th they're very similar to what was just described. I think I think we've been looking at what you've been doing as well over the years and copying a bit, if that's all right. And um, and those are not mandatory. They're guidelines, but it, it's a place for everyone to start. It's a normative uh, guideline. And then the board will either go up or down from that guideline, depending on their performance and, and, and their risk profile. Um, I, I think it's been a really good system for us. We have just recently with our reforms been able to, I, I think, more efficiently use our incarceration resources. And I put some of the data in there. As far as the, the early release data, we, we actually hadn't tracked that um, before because our, our intent is to always release somebody onto parole before they re-enter into the community, um, unless there's some extenuating circumstances or unless they refuse a parole. Um, but it looks like our, our grant rate for paroles is 92%. And I think that's even understating it because uh, we have, if someone's denied parole, they can come back after a certain number of years and ask for a redetermination. And, you know, if the risk profile has changed, then we do grant those. And then we also have a compassionate release program. So the idea that someone's going to terminate in prison is, uh, extremely rare in Utah and we, we it, it does still happen but but it's not ideal and um, I think that is a pretty good summary if you have any questions <laughs>
That's super helpful. Thank you very much. We're going to come back to all of you. Uh, Barbara Levine, you're on mute. Still on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> it's, only, it's only been two years of this, so yeah, right. <laughs> you're forgiven. Thank you again for having me. Um, before I focus on Michigan's sentencing and parole practices, I wanted to make a few preliminary points because when I prepared my overly long written submission, I didn't realize that you were uh, as interested as, as you are on focusing on community placements pre-parole. And I just wanted to let you know that until 1992, Michigan had a, a community residential program, CRP, that was very successful. Uh, at its peak, about 9% of the prison population was in CRP. It was about 3,500 people at the time. And it saved enormous amounts of money. It helped greatly to relieve overcrowding, which was the motivation for it initially, but it also produced about 90% parole grant rates because the board was able to see how people functioned in the community. The program was eliminated when Michigan adapted its version of truth and sentencing, which is people have to, everybody has to do 100% of their minimum sentence in a secure facility. So uh, we lost that ability, but I would certainly recommend it to others, especially today when it could be enhanced by uh, a lot of new knowledge about reentry. So also just note that while I'm going to highlight a lot of what I think are problems in Michigan, my written submission does highlight some, some good things in Michigan, particularly involving um, less serious offenses. The problems I'll mention are most applicable to the people who are serving long prison terms for serious assault of offenses. And the other preliminary note is I think that while Michigan has retained indeterminate sentences and parole, I don't really think the most important issue is whether a state has determinate or indeterminate sentences, parole or no parole, guidelines or statutory triads. Various systems for structuring decision-making can work. The issue is whether the system is designed to be effective at constraining discretion and whether it's enforceable. So, Turning to Michigan's guidelines, there are a number of pretty big issues. I won't go through all of them, but most obvious is the lack of a guidelines commission. I described that whole sad chronology in my submission, but the bottom line is that for 20 plus years since the legislative guidelines have been in effect, no one's been monitoring their effectiveness, recommending evidence-based changes or keeping up with revisions to the penal code. Instead, we have two decades of ad hoc amendments by the legislature. The requirement of compliance with the guidelines, unless there are substantial and compelling reasons to depart, ended in 2015 when our state Supreme Court changed the guidelines from mandatory to advisory. So sentences can be reviewed on appeal for overall reasonableness, which is generally in the eye of the beholder, but uh, not for compliance with the guidelines. When the legislative guidelines were developed in the 90s, one of the stated goals was to reduce disparity. However, the then Sentencing Commission resolved the debate over just how much discretion to leave to judges by creating minimum sentence ranges that are routinely, for the most serious offenses, seven and a half, 10, even 15 years wide, making tremendous disparity just inevitable under the system. Another goal was to divert more low-level folks into community sanctions, but increase sentence lengths for serious assault of offenses. And that lengthening was accomplished in multiple ways. Just a couple of examples are that the uh, starting points of the applicable guidelines ranges uh, are relatively high. That in scoring offense severity, they do things like score the real offense which can include conduct that was never charged or was charged and dismissed, like using a gun when the plea was to unarmed robbery, for instance. The feds use, the federal guidelines allow for this, but most other states don't. Uh, our guidelines double count factors that are elements of the offense, such as intent to murder when the conviction is for assault with intent to murder, uh, not reducing scores for mitigating circumstances, raising the prior record score, uh, by, for instance, allowing the applicable ranges to be broadened when prosecutors choose to apply habitual offender enhancements, even though this may double count convictions that were already scored as priors or count convictions so old they couldn't be scored as priors. 
And of course, this is another source of disparity because prosecutors vary greatly in the extent to which they charge those enhancements. Uh, our system also scores concurrent and subsequent convictions as priors. <laughs> so uh, many of us would like to see the legislature finally establish a new commission that would not only address these issues, but reassess the guidelines in the broad context of other factors that affect the actual time that people serve, like mandatory minimums and consecutive sentences and the lack of any sort of good time. All that having been said, it's important to note that Michigan judges don't routinely impose sentences that are as high as the guidelines allow. In fact, among the most serious offenses, downward departures run about anywhere from 23 to 40 percent, depending on the crime, and upward departures are far fewer. Um, I know I'm running out of time. I have some points about parole. I can do them or wait for questions. Let, let's let's wait for questions, because I, I think, especially in light of our prior panels, we are going to have a lot of questions about parole. Uh, Insha Rahman, is that, did I pronounce your name correctly? Rahman, that's, it's Rahman. close enough. Okay. Yeah. Apologies. Thank, of course. Um, thank you for having me, um, Insha Rahman, and I'm with the Vera Institute of Justice, and I'm really thankful to you all and the commission for um, asking the right questions about sentencing as it pertains to California, because it gives us an opportunity to look around the country and see what we are doing well and where we have a lot more work to do. Um, so I'll focus my introductory remarks on New York, um, and I am no expert on sentencing reform the way my um, co-panelists are, but what I do know is New York's um, sentencing scheme as well as sort of New York practice uh, well, given um, my work at Vera leading our New York work, as well as my time as a public defender. Um, New York is a fascinating story of doing sentencing reform, not at all uh, through legislation. I would say New York's sentencing scheme is one of the messiest in the country and is not one to look at and replicate in any way, shape or form. Um, some offenses uh, still receive indeterminate sentences and others like violent felony offenses, drug offenses, sex offenses, receive determinate sentences. And so what we see is a very messy, uh, uh, from, from person to person who is incarcerated, a very different sentencing scheme, depending on when you were sentenced and what you were sentenced to. However, New York's a, a great story of how you can reduce um, your use of incarceration. Just in the last two decades, New York went from having upwards of 73,000 people in state prison on any given day to where we are today, which is literally just shy of 31,000. Um, that's a decline of 60%. Uh, and it was done without making any uh, legislative changes um, that led to this kind of decarceration. And so what's really at play here is local dis discretion. And that discretion was entirely driven by New York City and what the New York City courts have done differently in the past 20 years to reduce the reliance on prison and incarceration as the default response to felony charges. So I'll name uh, uh, I'll tell a little bit of a story about New York City, and um, I have a lot of stats and information and specifics, but I'll hold that for the questions to be responsive to what you're most interested in. But when you think about New York State, which is uh, almost 20 million people statewide, it's really a state with two very distinct um, you know, parts of, of the state and two very distinct criminal legal systems, if you will. There's New York City and there's the 57 counties across New York City. Um, and they are basically split half and half and about 8.5 million people in the city and 8.5 million people across the state until about 19, uh, I'm sorry, until about 2002, the driver of the state prison population was in fact New York City. Uh, New York City was sending people away to prison at higher rates than the rest of the state and sending people away for longer. Today, um, of those uh, slightly under 31,000 people incarcerated, about one third are from New York City and the remainder are from upstate New York. And so in the past 20 years, what's really happened is New York City judges aren't sentencing people on felony convictions to prison. Um, the city itself has uh, invested significantly, more so than any other jurisdiction I have seen and studied in alternatives to incarceration, in allowing for discretion uh, at the local level to prosecutors, that even if a charge comes in as say a class B uh, felony to allow 
the case to be pled down to a lower charge. Um, the challenge with New York's sentencing scheme is that mandatory minimums abound. Um, and so prosecutors, unless they're willing to get creative, um, their, their hands are tied in terms of sentencing. And likewise with judges, when there's an indictment, judges can only offer a plea to the top charge on the indictment. And so that decline in New York City uh, for musing incarceration has really come from, I would say, creative practices by the prosecutor's offices, as well as a significant investment in alternatives to incarceration so that we're not sending people away for as long as we once did. And I think the, the real lesson there and uh, the lesson that we're trying to impart to the rest of the state is Incarceration and sending more people away to prison doesn't actually make you safer. Um, New York City has relied on incarceration less, certainly uh, in terms of prison, but also in terms of the local jail population, which in that same period of time has declined by two thirds. We had upwards of 22,000 people in New York City jails on any given day in the early 1990s. Today, we have under 6,000 people. Um, and again, that is because we've relied on incarceration less. And in that same period of time, we've actually watched crime, and especially violent crime, decline significantly in New York City. There are great historical lessons to learn here, uh, the lesson of what you do with local discretion and how you spend your criminal justice dollars and how political will can really drive um, a change in criminal justice reform in a way that you don't actually need the state legislature to act, or if it does, it's to really bring the good practices you see in one jurisdiction to, to other parts of the state. Wow, you really stole the show there for a second. Uh, so I, I wanna make sure I got this right. And then I'm gonna ask you, so you said, uh, that New York State reduced its prison population by 60%, is that correct? About 60%, yep. Six, six zero, mostly from New York City. Yes. And that New York City's jail population also reduced by over 60%. Yes. And this is, you say, through prosecutorial discretion using alternatives to incarceration. Yep. Principally. Okay, just wanted to make sure that th that's really phenomenal. I think a national story that hasn't been adequately told, candidly, is somebody, I'm a New Yorker even, and I don't, didn't even really know that. Um, I was wondering, I appreciate that you're saying that this was not legislatively mandated, but how did this come about? Was this just local political pressure and uh, prosecutors responding? Was it a new wave of prosecutors? Was it um, city or officials who are creating new opportunities? And or how might that be transferable else, elsewhere? Um, as, your, as, a, as a guess. So yeah. part of it is what actually happened and then what, how would you prescribe for others? Right. Um, I would say that the main driver was um, city elected officials between mayors and also city council um, who manage the, the budget, including the budget for the DA's offices. And um, DA Charles Hines, who is the longtime DA in Brooklyn, um, is known for being a pioneer in terms of alternatives to incarceration and running programs through his office. Um, he was the first to implement a felony gun diversion program, which was unheard of when it uh, was put in place over a decade ago. Nobody was diverting gun cases, and New York has some of the most stringent um, sentencing laws when it comes to guns. I might never have been arrested a day in my life if I actually um, am convicted of the gun possession charge. I'm doing a minimum of 3.5 years in state prison. That's how serious uh, the sentencing scheme is. And so it was really um, an investment in alternatives to incarceration that were mostly run by the DA's office, but also a network of community-based nonprofits. Um, and the city has historically invested millions and millions of city dollars into those nonprofits uh, to run programs. So the Center for Court Innovation is a really well-known um, organization that has many different alternatives to incarceration programs here in New York City, the Fortune Society, the Osborne Association. Uh, I don't know that I know another city that is as resource rich when it comes to ATIs, and it really is the difference that made a difference and helped to shift the tide, the political tide to say we can rely on alternatives, on diversion, and not on incarceration to deliver public safety. Just to, and just to clarify, and then I'll open it up to folks, so for example, the gun uh, example that you gave, which is a huge driver of California's prison population as I'm gonna guess elsewhere as well. Um, so it was a minimum five year sentence typically, but in this program, 
Uh, it was a diversion program. So meaning that if you completed the program, then you didn't, then you didn't get a sentence. Exactly. Got it. Um, wow, that's a really amazing success story. Uh, I have a million questions as usual. Do others have any questions at this point? All right, uh, Mr. Thompson, I, 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 want to, I want to ask about uh, you talk because you said a couple of things that really stood out to me that I wrote down that I want to make sure I got right or understood a little bit better. Um, so Utah has an indeterminate set system, but a guidelines. And the guidelines are not administered by judges, they're administered by the parole or pardon commission or what the board, what, is that right? Yeah, so we have sentencing guidelines uh, created by our sentencing commission, uh, which includes judges and uh, defense attorneys and prosecutors, just everyone from the criminal justice community. Um, and but in an in individual case, what I'm saying is you're not sentenced to the guidelines, you're sentenced to that indeterminate term, and then the board says, okay, you fall within this guidelines, so that's going to be your presumptive sentence, is that right? Exactly. The judge makes an in or out decision if they're going to prison or not. If, if they come to prison, then it's the board who eventually determines length based on the sentencing guidelines, or starting with the sentencing guidelines. Right. And then you said, and about, you said 90% of folks get out, and I presume you're saying get out according to those guidelines. Is that correct? When you say 90% parole grant rate? Yes, released before the statutory maximum. We can go, we can't go past that, those statutory maximums, but Got we can go below the minimums. Got it. And what is this, what's the legal standard that the board uses? So it, so it has the guidelines. Is there some dangerousness standard? I, I, I don't know if you overheard some of our conversation earlier. So can you, what's the standard in, in Utah? So uh, we, do you mean like an evidentiary standard or? No, I meant like uh, risk to public safety or risk to commit a violent crime or have you committed your, participated in programming or what, is, how does the parole board decide whether or not actually this person is, should be released? Yeah, uh, we, we use, we start with the guidelines to schedule our hearings and kind of that, use that as a starting point. And then we have a structured decision-making uh, tool that we apply um, usually, uh, we have to have a hearing um, in, in person generally before someone can be released from prison based on our constitutional requirements for victim participation. Um, and then, so based on the information we gather from that hearing with our structured decision making, with the guidelines, with any available risk assessments, and everybody has at least one risk assessment, uh, then, then we can make that release decision and tailor the uh, parole conditions based on the, the specific needs of that person. But it's a public safety determination at the end of the day, is that right? Yes, uh, it's basically, we say maximize public safety within the limits of the constitution. Got it. So often that means that principles like ret retribution, that sort of thing have to take a back seat. And then uh, I'm grilling you here, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. how, do plea, how do plea bargains work? So, right, um, uh, how do I know what I'm pleading to if I'm pleading to uh, an indeterminate sentence? You know, that, that, that's one of the issues because we've, we've had some problems in the past where, you know, they'll, they'll agree to a plea bargain based on the guidelines and then maybe somebody else will write a letter to the board specifically saying, sure, we agreed to this guideline, but you should go over because of all these aggravating factors. And, um, you know, that's, that's not really a, a professional way to go about things. But, uh, you know, we, we get the... Um, the guideline and, and we look at all the factors independently. And sometimes we do have to adjust based on really strange plea agreements that are, are gonna create disparate results. Uh, one of the, the duties of the Board of Pardons is to normalize the sentencing across the state. Um, so if one county is offering this sort of plea bargain all the time and the other county isn't, uh, it creates this huge disparity that's absolutely not tied to any sort of public safety or you know, public interest at all. And it's, it's the board's duty then to apply the guidelines, apply our structured decision-making and, and normalize those results. And, and then this will be my, my last question. I'm very curious if other folks have questions. Um, so as I suppose you're aware, um, in, 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 judges typically, in, at least in California, let's just say, Judges oppose the sentence. And we don't really have guidelines, but we have this sort of triad, it's guideline-ish. Um, your system transfers that responsibility to the board, 
And I was wondering, and, and, and we, th we, we think and we talk a lot about whether or not judges are the appropriate institutional um, actor to be making these decisions or if, it if it's better in, a, in different hands. And I was wondering if you could reflect it, and I don't know if you've had different experiences or not on Utah and that it being in, outside of the courtroom's decision basically to apply these guidelines and then make the ultimate, you know, length of custody determination rather than uh, a judge and just and, and not having that really as a judge's determination at all. I, I think uh, one of the hardest parts for a sentencing judge uh, in a determinant sentencing system is that they have to guess what's going to happen in the case. They're working on very little data, even if they have, you know, some robust memos about sentencing memos. They don't know how the person's going to react to treatment. They don't know how they're going to be in the institution. Uh, they don't know what kind of changes this person's going to go through. So uh, we make the decision on the back end after we've seen how they've performed, after we've seen their responsivity. And it's really surprising. And a lot of people would get out much earlier than, than uh, would be expected at the day of sentencing. And some people stay in longer than would be expected at the day of sentencing. And I, th I think that's one of the strengths of our system. And I know I promised I had only one last question, but do you know what your state's recidivism rate is or can you? So <laughs> I know it's a tough question. It's a tough question. And um, we've been moving away from recidiv like the term recidivism rate just as one solid measure, um, because really what we're looking at most importantly is public safety. So we don't keep one standard recidivism rate. We do look at um, lowering in intensity and lowering in density um, in, in positive movements towards public safety. So it's always a public safety focus. Uh, one of the things we've done too that's kind of uh, messed up that I think um, unnuanced recidivism rate number is we've released so many people on parole and we've been doing it for a little more than a decade now with the idea of we want everybody at least to have um, ideally at least two years in the community before their, their sentence terminates. And what that's done over the years is it's increased the number of people who return to prison on parole. Uh, just because we have more people on parole, we have more people returning. And so it looks like recidivism rates by that definition of do you commit a new crime or do you return to prison has gone up, but our public safety hasn't uh, decreased. The crime rates held steady. So I don't have, that's a long way of saying uh, don't have one recidivism rate for you, and we don't even rely on that anymore. That in and of itself is, I think, very interesting to me. All right, uh, Justice Marino, and then uh, Professor Ochi. Yeah, that's uh, the idea that the judge doesn't impose the sentences is, is really uh, remarkable. You know, I was on the, the trial court, state court, for about 11 years, uh, and sentencing is, I guess, one of the more you know, one of the harder parts of being a, a, a judge, but there's something about your system that actually appeals to me. And that is that, you know, after several years on the bench, I could generally intuitively feel that this was a state prison case or this was not a prison case, whether you're going to send someone to prison or not. So I guess I was making that determination, but then following up with a, an actual, you know, number of years or, or months uh, in prison. Has this always been the, the case in, in Utah where the judges didn't actually impose sentence, their only decision was prison or not prison and the sentencing was left to the, to the, uh, the, the parole board or the sentencing, the sentencing commission. Uh, and you mentioned that sometimes the ultimate sentence is less than what the judge might have <clears throat> imposed himself or herself. In making the determination that this is a prison case, uh, does the judge make a record as to why they think that is the case, kind of giving uh, some guidelines as to uh, what an appropriate term might be uh, for the actual sentence to be imposed uh, by the sentencing commission? I don't know if that makes sense or not. But. It, it does. I, I don't know historically uh, when our, the, this sort of uh, system, this sort of shared sentencing system yeah. 
uh, was in place, but I, I know it's been around as long as our indeterminate sentencing has been in place. And starting from the, the inception of the state of Utah as a state with a state constitution, um, the Board of Parole and Pardons was given broad powers to adjust these things. For instance, we, our governor doesn't do the pardons in, in Utah, it's, it's the Board of Pardons and Parole. And so, uh, which comes down to the, the, the minimum sentences or the maximum minimum sentence, um, they don't really exist because the board could always pardon anybody or commute their sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's this inherent constitutional power that we have. So even if the statute says this must be a 15 to life, if there's good cause showing, um, according to our structured decision making, uh, we can go below that. And, you know, there's also this issue of consecutive and concurrent sentencing. And so I would say a lot of judges in Utah, not a lot, but some rankle at the fact that they don't get to determine what happens to the person, you know, long term. And so they'll try to sometimes manipulate it. I, I, I shouldn't say this in a bad way. I, I think they're, they're really usually doing it honestly, but sometimes they'll use consecutive and concurrently inconsistently with their colleagues. Um, and so again, we have to be able to adjust that as well. Um, and, and we regularly do. Our guidelines give, uh, much like Minnesota, they, they give a recommendation based on a criminal history score um, and the level of offense and the type of offense, uh, a recommendation to the judge as to whether the person should have jail as a condition of probation, uh, presumptive probation, or whether they should go to prison. And they can deviate from that if they just make a statement on the record as to their purposes or their, their basis for deviating from those guidelines. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I think, I think it did, yes. Professor Ochin. Thank you, uh, and thank you to you all. Um, I have a few questions. I'll start uh, with Mr. Thompson. Um, I'm, I'm quite struck by the statistic that you shared with us uh, about the, not necessarily the release rate, but the number of people um, who are granted parole prior to serving their maximum uh, sentence. Um, and uh, the, it's, that figures relationship to what seems to be a presumption in favor of, of release. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that presumption because that's you know something that came up in the first panel. Um, it's not something that we we have in California, uh, and I'm wondering how that's operationalized and how do you all define uh, extraordinary circumstances, which uh, seems to be a standard that you all use if you uh, decline to release someone um, uh, at a particular. Uh, period of review. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that presumption and um, the standard of extraordinary circumstances. How is that defined? Uh, and it seems, uh, and how is it utilized? So uh, again, with our, our board being focused on public safety and not necessarily some of the other values that are necessarily at sentencing in different phases, um, we look at two scenarios. One scenario is that you take a person who has been in prison, let's say, on a second degree felony and is going up against their 15 year maximum, uh, which means that they've, they've been risky enough that there's some issue, right? And then they hit their 15 year maximum sentence and they're out. And I can't think of a greater risk to the public than that. You've got someone with no support, no services, a high risk profile, someone who may have had some treatment or maybe didn't because you know it doesn't matter when they reach that max, there's nothing you can do to work with them at that point. So that is, from a public safety standpoint, a disaster in our mind. Um, so what we try to do with everybody is at least have, and we use an evidence-based um, window of about two years. If someone's successful on parole for about two years, they're generally fairly safe. Um, and so we usually wanna have at least two years and often we'd love to have a lot more than that to place them on parole in the community uh, where they're connected to services, they may go to a halfway house uh, to continue treatment. Um, they'll, they'll have someone checking up on them uh, to make sure that they have housing and they're getting in touch with mental health, substance use services, uh, help, them, help them get a job and monitoring them to see if they're gonna commit any new crimes. And if they do, then we pull them back and we have um, caps. So they come back to prison, maybe get some more treatment and then we release them again. Um, and we'll release them again and again and again until they're successful. 
because again, the worst thing in our mind is that they terminate and go out into the state without any support. Thank you. Uh, and so my, my second question is uh, for, for um, Ms. Rahman. Um, uh, um, you know, what you described, I, I agree with um, uh, Chair Romano, uh, are extraordinary figures uh, in terms of the reductions in New York State's um, prison population. But I'm wondering about this, the strategy, right, which seems to be highly discretionary and subject to repeal. Uh, if you get, you know, the winds, the political winds change at, as they are, um, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I, I saw the press conference from the current mayor about the crime rates uh, being relatively stable or even down in some categories, right? The public has this perception that crime rates are going up um, and that shifting the political winds. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, different strategies for uh, reform or, or change, right? We're looking at legislative change. What you're describing is slightly more ad hoc uh, and local. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you, you can talk a bit about some of the, the drawbacks or, or benefits of that approach, especially as we're considering you know, making recommendations around funding uh, incentives and so forth for uh, you know, local boards of supervisors um, and district attorneys um, to, to drive down uh, rates of incarceration. So I'm wondering if you can just, uh, just discuss that. Of course. Um, you couldn't be more right that this is a sort of ad hoc way to get to sentencing reform, and it's not ideal. Ideally, we would pass state legislative reform that applies equally across a jurisdiction um, and not have it be done in such an ad hoc manner. But uh, that just simply hasn't been politically possible in New York. There is some momentum now for parole reform and sentencing reform, but it is nascent and it comes uh, really on the heels of us uh, struggling to hold firm on reforms that we've made to bail, which I'm sure many of you followed the political wins on that. We passed bail reform, reduced the statewide jail population by over 40% as a result. And uh, less than three months after the reforms had gone into effect, the legislature rolled some of it back because of the intense political pressure. So uh, New York right now, the legislature, I would say, um, has been chilled from taking on other kinds of criminal justice reform because we have a very recent sort of lesson, a spanking, if you will, uh, for actually doing what I would say is the right thing and uh, the thing that is consistent with public safety and trying to enact that statewide. Um, so having said that, if the political wins are in your favor um, at the state legislature, I would say the three most important reforms to codify what New York City has done in an ad hoc way are first and foremost to invest in sort of closing the front door to the prison system in the first place. Um, you know, I had said, look, I have the bad news about New York um, that I won't share sort of up front, but here's the bad news is we have people who are serving very, very long sentences um, of those less than 31,000 people who are currently behind bars. And let me give you a, a taste of that. So, um, you know, 16% uh, of our um, prison population right now are serving indeterminate sentences where there is life on the back end. Our parole board releases slightly under 40% of people who come before it, which is, I would say, uh, one of the lower uh, release rates. Um, we did an analysis that if um, New York State's parole board actually got to the level of what um, you know other states like Michigan, my understanding is the parole release rate is closer to 70%, we'd have another 10 that that's wrong. Okay, well, good to know. Um, but if it were close to 70%, we'd have 10,000 fewer people behind bars. So I just, I say all of that to say New York is far from perfect, um, even though New York City has made great strides. So closing the front door to the prison system would mean actually investing statewide in um, alternatives to incarceration diversion, because I couldn't agree more with Mr. Thompson that the worst thing we can do for public safety is to not provide supports and services and oversight to people. People succeed when we have a supportive uh, model for community-based sort of intervention and sentences, but we have to set them up right. Um, second, New York has very uh, difficult mandatory minimums. We have to get rid of them, and we have to address predicate sentencing, which is 
uh, from our analysis, the biggest driver of racial disparities in the prison system, even though we've decarcerated our racial disparities in who remains behind bars has actually gotten worse over time. And that's because of pred predicate sentencing laws. So that's how you address the front end of the system. Uh, the second one is um, to the extent that uh, about half of all people incarcerated in New York state prisons are serving indeterminate sentences and they will go in front of the parole board. We have to make changes to the parole board itself. It is a very political process of who is nominated to the parole board. Um, it is a parole board that is not reflective of uh, the background um, and the demographics of people who are incarcerated in New York state or people who experience the criminal legal system, and that is a problem. Um, and there are other states that actually have parole board requirements of the composition is that it actually is reflective of the geographic diversity, uh, the demographic diversity of the state. New York needs to do that, and I would recommend that other places do that as well. And that there is a presumption of release. There's a parole bill pending in New York State, didn't pass this legislative session, but it would in fact create a presumption of release and um, model what other jurisdictions that have passed um, a presumption uh, in front of the parole board, which is that people are released unless there is an immediate public safety concern um, that justifies uh, not, not releasing the person. So that is really what needs to happen when it comes to the parole board. And then finally, there's about half of the prison population they're serving determinate sentences in New York State, you serve uh, six sevenths of the sentence, people are serving very, very long sentences. We need to put in place second look provision um, because we know this from the research um, after a certain amount of time in incarceration, uh, there is no meaningful public safety benefit for incarcerating people beyond that period of time. And you can imagine a, a second look provision that allows people to petition to the courts for resentencing another look at their sentence at the five-year mark, at the 10-year mark, Max, certainly, I think a, a, a strong presumption of release after the 20 year mark, given what we know of the, the, the research that that is more than enough to guarantee public safety. And if what we're prioritizing is uh, retribution, hopefully we've gotten enough of that after 20 years. So those are the three legislative fixes that I think would be necessary in New York to really codify and see across the rest of the state the kind of remarkable change that we've seen in New York City. Thank you. And I just have one last question. Um, and for Ms. Levine, um, Ms. Levine, I was very intrigued by uh, some of your comments about, you know, sort of taking you, taking you back in time to the, the, I think you said it was the 1990s, um, when Michigan permitted people to serve uh, parts of their sentence sort of in the community. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about um, that program uh, and um, you know how that might be operationalized in a state like uh, California uh, on a statewide uh, level, if, if you um, if you're able to speculate. Well, it was you know it was relatively straightforward. People became there was strong eligibility criteria that took into account the offense and you know institutional conduct. People who were within six to 24 months of their earliest release date uh, were eligible depending on the offense. And they would go to either a community correction center or into the community on tether. And, but they were, they were not on parole. They were part of the prison population so that if there was a screw up, you didn't have to go through the parole revocation process. They could come straight back. And as I say, it was motivated initially by an overcrowding crisis, which it certainly helped to reduce but it was quite successful because prisoners were highly motivated to get into the program. So that helped with in-prison conduct. They were motivated to stay out. Um, there was a period of time when those who were administering the program introduced sort of a zero tolerance policy and were sending people back for you know, being 10 minutes late after curfew um, even when there was a good explanation for why people were late, that I would certainly recommend against overdoing that, and probably that wouldn't happen today. And I hope that programs like that today would be more sophisticated in terms of doing needs assessment and making sure that resources are available to people in the community that to, to you know treat their needs. But in terms of implementing it, I mean, it's a lot cheaper than prison. In this state, the problem is simply the legislation, the, 
prosecutors in the state have treated truth in sentencing as, as a red line. And we already had what is the federal equivalent of truth in sentencing. We had 85% uh, people doing 85% of their sentences on average when truth and sentencing became a thing on the federal level and there was all this federal money to induce states to comply with it. We were already in compliance. We were already using federal prison building money, but there yeah. were those who felt they had to do something in order to you know, look tough and call something truth and sentencing. So they mm -hmm. went to 100% and they added this secure, do it in a secure facility requirement. But you apparently already allow for this sort of community residential placement, it's a question of using uh, funding it. Yeah, and, and in terms of eligible, in terms of eligibility, were people who were uh, serving time for violent or serious crimes eligible for that? You know, I'd, have, I'd have to go. You're, you're you're talking almost twenty years. I'd have yeah. to go back and and check what the eligibility requirements are if I could even find them. But my recollection is that. Um, Probably not sex offenders, um, maybe murder. Sex offenses are always treated worse than, than murder, actually. Um, but um, like I say, there was a difference in when you were eligible that depended on the offense, but I don't know if it was limited to non, I don't think it was limited to nonviolent offenses. I would have to check and I can try and find out for you. Thank you. So, um... I'd risk of taking over again, but I, I would like to go around the horn. This is a bit of a good transition from uh, what Ms. Levine was saying into our next uh, panel. I'm curious about uh, halfway houses or residential treatment programs or whatever term, but I, I'm curious about the availability or requirement of residential uh, programs post-release either presently or historically in this, in your states, if they exist, if they're just merely nonprofits that are helpful or if there's true halfway house programs. Uh, Ms. Mitchell, I was gonna start with you, but you seem to be like thinking, jogging your memory bank. So I don't wanna put you on the spot, but uh, I'm gonna. Yeah, you know, I, I know that we do have them, but I'm not as knowledgeable on, on that piece there. Um, Cause I do know that during COVID that was, uh, you know, how we, how we released some folks was to, to those facilities in order to relieve pressure on, um, on the prison, on the prisons. But I couldn't tell you, you know, a whole lot about them other than that, you know, they do exist, um, they are out there. <laughs> Uh, Miss Levine, and we've been calling you Miss Levine. Is it Levine Levine? It's Barbara, actually, but. <laughs> oh, now you're mute. And my middle name is technically technologically challenged. Um, it's it's Levine, but it, Barbara's okay. fine. Um, there's no question that in Michigan, people who are eligible for parole and people who are eligible once they've served their minimum, there's no question they get placed. Uh, they often have conditions that they go into programs before they community-based programs before they um, as, as a condition of parole. Residential. Can be. Uh, it happens to sex offenders a lot. Um, there's also been a really strong effort by Michigan's parole board to speed up the release of people who have mental, mental health issues by finding suitable placements for them. They actually contract with a vendor who specializes in it. So it's not that people who are mentally ill, and of course there's tons of them in, in prison, in, in, our, in the state prison system, um, weren't getting paroled, but it was a longer time to parole because it was hard to find suitable placements. And so they've worked hard at, at improving that process. Um, I don't know that a lot of people are being released directly to substance abuse treatment. I think it's it, it's more common with sex offenders, but um, and of course other tr non-residential treatment programs. But um, as a condition of parole, Ms. Rahman. Um. So I was actually just looking up the number to find out how many folks are admitted to New York State prisons on new charges versus for violations of uh, parole. And it turns out 
are admitted just on violations of parole, not on new charges. Um, because New York, while uh, New York City does, I would say, an excellent job of keeping people out of prison, we don't have the kind of infrastructure and services that are necessary to keep people out uh, when they're on parole. Um, we have really high rates of technical parole violations. New York State just passed this past legislative session a bill um, that limits the use of incarceration for technical violations, which we hope will make a really big difference um, of those uh, slightly under 31,000 people who are currently incarcerated, over 5,000 are there for violations of parole, not on new charges. Um, so, you know, in New York City, about half of all people who are released from state prison actually go directly into the shelter system, um, which is the very worst case scenario for where people should go. Um, there needs to be much more work done um, to build out the the infrastructure of nonprofit housing, transitional housing that is actually quality, safe, supportive um, to keep people out. Um, there are great examples though, there are few and far between, but there are great examples of programs that work that have a far better success rate in New York. Um, one that's in upstate New York, um, it's in Syracuse. It's run by the Center for Community Alternatives. It's called the Freedom Center. And there's a longstanding, very well-known program run by the Fortune Society in New York City called the Castle. Um, so just to the extent that it's helpful to look to specific models, um, those are two that I point out regularly to say, this is what we should be doing in terms of planning and supports for everybody who's coming home from prison so that they have a chance to succeed. I had a, I had a quick question, and then I'll go to you, Mr. Thompson, and then we got to wrap up this panel. I know that people leaving prison, especially if you're leaving for a long period of time, have different needs than people who are on the front end. But are these frequently these treatment programs and the facilities themselves, can they almost serve dual purpose? And maybe this is a better question for our next panel, meaning it's alternative to incarceration and it's also a re-entry. Does that work or not really? I mean, you were I'm asking you because you were such a strong advocate of alternatives to incarceration. I think it can work if we actually set up the programs um, to be as supportive as we do for alternatives to incarceration. Um, you know, and as I pointed to the two models that I think work really well for reentry, because they look essentially the same as an ATI program in that they have far more in the way of support, services, oversight. Um, and, and all of that. So I think it's possible. I think it's a question of, again, um, not putting the punishment um, first and actually putting the supports and sort of rehabilitation and, and services first. Right, and that's why I asked because they seem to have a similar mission, although again, very different maybe needs of people coming out versus people in the front end. And Mr. Thompson, uh, back just to you and then we'll wrap up. In Utah, is there any type of formal halfway house or for lack of a better term, re-entry program like that, residential I'm particularly interested in? Yes, there is. Uh, we call them community correction centers, but they're, they're your standard halfway house. Uh, we don't release anybody to homelessness. So you either have to have an address that's been verified by our probation and parole services before you release, or you go to a CCC, a community correctional center automatically, and you'll be there until you can establish uh, an approved housing. We have specific uh, halfway houses. We have one that's specific for substance abuse. Uh, treatment. So if if you need that treatment, but we don't need to incarcerate you any longer, we can send you to this halfway house to get that treatment. Uh, we have one for sex offender treatment, um, and we have uh, one for mentally ill offenders. If we could, I, I think we have pretty good capacity with most of those, except for the mentally ill offenders uh, halfway house, um, which is obviously very complicated. And uh, just to clarify, is this only for people who don't have appropriate housing or might every might you need to go to one of these programs regardless of whether or not you have appropriate housing? If, if, if your parole date comes up and you don't have appropriate housing, you will be sent uh, to a, a standard generic uh, correctional center until you can find appropriate housing. Um, and then, but the board could also order you to go to a community correctional center until you're stabilized, until you have a job and housing, or we could order you to do a specific treatment program. So again, just to clarify, so you could say, okay, we know that you have a stable place to live, to live, but we're not quite sure that you're, we want you to be more stable before. So we're going to send you to a correctional program, two, six months or however many, whatever period, and then you'll, you're able to be fully released to go home. Is that right? Or am I oversimplifying? 
that's exactly it. So it's like someone was released to parole and they had stable housing, but they never got into their uh, mental health substance abuse evaluation and they recidivated and they came back to us. So we said next time, okay, we know you have a stable house, but we need to make sure that you get hooked up with services in the community. So you're going to go to this halfway house until that's been completed. So that's, that's one example. And that works because typically there's a tail on their sentence. So you have the ability to do that. Exactly. If we, if we run out of their sentence, then we can't mitigate the, the threat to public safety at all. Got it. All right. We're just at the end of the time, but I do want to make sure that there's nobody in the committee who has uh, additional questions. Otherwise, I'm going to thank this panel and move on. All right. You know, uh, one of the uh, advantages, I will say, of uh, this, these times that we're living in is that we're able to reach out to people across the country and have you come and, and, and really, uh, I've learned a ton from just hearing from all of you from different parts of the country. I, I, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing. I, I'm confident um, so myself or staff or somebody will be reaching out to you for more information. You were super, super helpful. Likewise, if you have other suggestions or thoughts for us, and this goes for everybody to please um, uh, contact us. Uh, thanks again. Uh, let's take a, a four minute break and reconvene it at uh, 4.30 for our final panel. Thank you all very much. <laughs>